Hi, I noticed that you were taking a look at my poster. Would you like me to give you a walkthrough? Great. So I'm William Knapp, and I'm from Eastern Oregon University, and I conducted a YouTube experiment online using YouTube as an experimental platform. You might wonder why I would do this. Well, I teach research methods a lot, and one of the things that um, I'm always looking to do is have my students perform their own experiments. And some of the places that I've been don't have access to experimental generation software like E-Prime, and instead of having students use paper and pencil techniques or confounded techniques where they would maybe give the entire class one video or one music presentation or some manipulation at point A and then a different one in point B without counterbalancing, um, I wanted to give them a better alternative because you can use YouTube to counterbalance. So in this experiment, I used the classic uh, Stroop task. So participants were asked to read through a series of words, actually not read the words, but to identify the colors that a series of words were printed in. They were also instructed to uh, pause the YouTube video when they had finished reading through. This was a bit of a problem as the space bar um, didn't always pause the video. Um, also for individuals who didn't have access to a space bar, uh, this was impossible. They could have done something else, but due to lots of differences in platforms, I think using the space bar was a poor choice. However, um, once I identified this as a problem, I instructed my participants to look at the time in the video as soon as they had finished reading through the list. So in the classic Stroop condition, you have congruent uh, conditions where the words and the colors match one another, and you also have incongruent conditions where the words don't match with the color. So I had uh, the two primary conditions of interest, congruent and incongruent, and to make sure that there wasn't a difference between the words on the list and also to not use the same words both times, I had two word lists. So I counterbalanced word lists with congruence, and I had participants assign themselves to the appropriate word list based on their month of birth. So what they did when they came and uh, went to my YouTube experiment, which you can find a link for right here, they got an informed consent video, uh, went, went, which went through all the normal stuff in the informed consent. And on the, or at the end of the video, they were given an option if they were interested in participating to please uh, pick the appropriate condition. So the, each condition was listed with three birth months. So all they had to do was click the condition that they were in, and then um, that link took them to another YouTube video, and that began the experiment. So the flow went through an informed consent. They clicked. They went to the first YouTube or the first experimental condition, which might have been congruent or incongruent. Then they went to the next experimental condition, which was the opposite. And then finally, at the end of that, they clicked, and that took them to a debriefing video. Now, um, there are some things that I want to mention with this. So one of my participants reported an impossible condition. So there are only four um, based on you know, two lists of words, congruent versus incongruent, and the actual words that are on that list. So there are only four conditions, but one of my participants indicated they were in condition six. That's bad. So as soon as I saw this, I instructed my students to instead of reporting the condition number, to actually report the month that they were born in. I figured that they'd probably be pretty good at that. Um, so anyway, they were going to indicate the time that they had completed each list, and they are also going to indicate their month of birth or the condition. So the results, as you can see here, were highly significant. I had 54 students attempt to finish the experiment. Um, I eliminated eight of those from the data analysis. The one is the one that reported the condition that didn't exist. And the other seven were individuals who reported times um, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. So these lists of words appeared at 29 seconds into the video, and they reported, uh, at least these seven, reported times of 29 seconds or less, which suggests that they didn't actually read through the words or that there was some other problem, so I eliminated them as well. But from the remaining uh, 46 participants, we have the typical Stroop effect, so incongruent is much slower than congruent. So some tips, because not only was this designed to see whether YouTube could detect effects is also designed to see like what some limitations or weaknesses of YouTube would be and also to try to overcome some of those. So one I would suggest using a powerful manipulation. If I just gave them one word, you know, the difference between congruent and incongruent is probably going to be on the order of milliseconds and I wanted something on the order of seconds. 
because they're reporting seconds in the video. So use something that's powerful. Keep things simple. There's no opportunity that you have to clarify instructions. So if you um, instruct them to report condition and you offer conditions one, two, three, and four, you might get something like six. So use something simple that the students are most likely going to be able to do. Um, also, avoid using pause if you're doing time-dependent uh, Time dependent dependent variables. Uh, instead, have them look at the, the time on the video. If you're using other measures like accuracy rate or percent recall, number of intrusions, things like that, that's not really so much um, uh, an issue. You should avoid using pause. As I indicated, pause work inconsistently. And watch out for eye products. I had some students who tried to do this on iPhones and iPads, and they weren't able to follow the links as those were used or those use Flash, and not all the i products have um, Flash capabilities. So in summary, despite several weaknesses, YouTube can be used as a viable experimental platform. There are lots of other platforms out there that might have uh, a greater ability to detect smaller effects. Um, but if you're in a research methods course, this is actually a way that you can potentially uh, collect some experimental data that's been properly counterbalanced, or that has had the independent variables properly counterbalanced. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments below. Thanks.